I've entitled today's sermon, Godliness with Contentment. Our passage today is Philippians 4, verses 10 through 20. Well, we're coming to the end of our study. Um, this amazing passage that we're going to read today contains three of the most well-known and beloved phrases or sentences in the entire letter. In Philippians 4, verse 11, 13, and 19, Paul says, I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. And then that well-known verse, I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. And finally, and my God will supply every need of yours according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. All of these, Paul's closing words, and all of these three statements focus in on one theme, and that's the theme of contentment. That's what we're going to be looking at together this morning. Now, as beautiful as those words are, if you've been reading through this passage this week in preparation to hear God's Word this morning, you might get the wrong impression from Paul's language here. If you're paying close attention to what Paul says to the Philippians about not needing what they have sent him and about waiting a long time uh, since the last time he received something from them, you could get the idea that Paul is being a little bit rude or maybe he's being snarky or complaining about the fact that the Philippians haven't sent him a gift in a long time. Or that now having received the gift, well, he really doesn't need it. Or really, well, it's more important that they gave the gift than the fact that he received the gift. Well, that could come across as ungrateful. But if you're reading that pass the passage that way, well, you're reading it wrongly. Because that's not what Paul is doing here. In this passage, Paul is doing three things simultaneously. First of all, he's saying thank you. And we know how genuine he is about this. Because you remember how he started the letter back in chapter 1, verse 5, by saying thank you to the Philippians for their generosity. In fact, it seems that Paul's almost embarrassed that the Philippians have been so gracious to him. Have you ever been preparing for ministry or you're maybe going on a short-term mission trip or getting ready for some other form of ministry and someone who you know makes less than you do gave you a sacrificial gift toward that ministry? You know, they pulled out a $10 bill, a $20 bill, and they, they gave you a gift and you're sitting there thinking, wow, this is really humbling. Uh, th this person is not as, as able to give even as I am, and yet they're giving me this gift. I know that happened when Susie and I were going to seminary for my final two years at RTS many years ago. We sold our house, we moved to Oviedo, Susie took a job working for Seminole County Schools, and we didn't have much money in those days. And some people gave sacrificially to help us complete that vital coursework so that I could finish my degree and I, and I could go into ministry. It's a humbling thing to receive that kind of gift. And that's the kind of situation <clears throat> Paul's in here. It's not that Paul is rolling in the dough. He's not. And he knows that the congregation is exceedingly poor. At the same time, they are exceedingly generous. And it's almost embarrassing to receive a gift from them. So you can be sure that when the Apostle Paul thanks them, he really means it because he knows this congregation. They are less able than any other congregation in Macedonia to give him support. And yet he's going to say later on in this passage, they have been the only congregation to stick with me through my ministry. Even when he was in Thessalonica, with people who were there who could have supported him more easily than the Philippians, it was the Philippians that were supporting the ministry in Thessalonica. So that Paul can say, let me tell you what, to God's glory, these folks stuck with me through thick and thin when everybody else forgot me. So that's the first thing Paul wants to do. He genuinely wants to thank the Philippians. But the second thing is he wants to make sure that the Philippians don't misunderstand and think that somehow he's asking them to send more. Uh, Paul wants to make it clear that that's not what I'm doing. I'm not lavishly thanking you so that you'll send me more. In fact, he makes it clear what you have sent is more than enough. I don't need any more. I'm in great shape. I received the gift that you sent by Epaphroditus. I'm fine. Please do not hear my thank you as me begging for more money or for more support. That's not what I'm doing. So Paul wants to make it clear. I'm not asking you for more. What you've sent is more than enough. But along with this, Paul wants to do a third thing in Philippians 4, verses 10 through 20. He wants to teach the Philippians something vitally important about the Christian life. He wants to teach yet another huge lesson in the Christian life. And that lesson is a lesson that Paul has learned. And it is a lesson that he wants the Philippians to learn, especially because of their poverty. It's a lesson about contentment. 
So let's hear God's word, and before we do, let's pray. Heavenly Father, by your Spirit, will you open our, our eyes to behold the truth of your word. Lord, uh, help us as we hear it read. Will you work it down into our hearts, illuminate it to our minds, and apply it to us as only you can by your Spirit. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. This is God's word. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have re revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increase, increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gift you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. We thank the Lord that He has spoken to us in His holy, inerrant, infallible, and all-sufficient Word. So are you content right where you are now, right in your life situation? Have you learned the secret of contentment? You know, if, if somebody was distracted today during the note-taking portion this morning and they missed the secret of contentment, they didn't have it in their notes at the end of the service, and they grabbed you by the collar on the way out the door, and they said, well, what was it? In one sentence, could you say that you know what it is? That you know where it comes from? Or are you one of those honest people that who, in the quietness of your heart or in your solitude, you look in the mirror in the bathroom, and, and you look at yourself and you say, no, I am not content. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I've not arrived at contentment. I'm not living in contentment. I'm struggling in the fog of my discontentment right now. Well, I have good news for you. Precisely because you are where you are, Paul has a word for you, especially today. And in this passage, he teaches us five things about gospel contentment. He teaches us about the need for contentment, about the nature of contentment, about the secret of contentment, about the theme song of contentment, and about the gratitude of contentment. So let's look at those five things today. The first thing, the need for contentment. Paul wants Christians to understand that God wants them to be content. God desires His people to live in a state of contentment. And so in verse 11, Paul is going to speak of the need for and the importance of gospel contentment. Listen to what he says in verse 11. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. He's commending to the Philippians his state of contentment. And he's saying to them and to us that God wants Christians to live in a state of contentment. And Paul talks about this all the time. I mean, think of 2 Corinthians 12, 10, where he says, For the sake of Christ, then, I am content. Now, listen to the circumstance in which he says this. He says, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. Now, you might be thinking, Paul, well, you need to go talk to a therapist if you're content with that. But for Paul, it's very important, and he follows that up by saying, for when I am weak, then I am strong. And in 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 8, he says, now there is great gain in godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. The author of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, stated this same truth. He said, Keep your life free from the love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. God is concerned for his people to be content. 
It is a significant and important need for the Christian life. Secondly then, the nature of contentment. Now it's very important that we understand the nature of this contentment as well. Because there are all sorts of theories about contentment out there and how you attain it. But in verse 11, Paul tells us something else about the nature of contentment. So look at what he says at the end of verse 11. For I have, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Isn't that encouraging? There are three encouragements in verse 11 uh, for us to help us with contentment to regard that. The first encouragement is, well, Paul had to learn how to be content. That, that, that's absolutely wonderful to hear. I mean, this is instructive to me. Paul didn't just see Jesus and become content. Paul had to learn how to be content. And that means that there's hope for you and me. If, if we're not living in a state of contentment, well, join the club. Paul had to learn contentment. The second encouragement is contentment is not innate to the Christian experience. It is learned. So you don't, you don't just trust Jesus and suddenly become content. Oh yes, there's a certain kind of contentment that immediately comes when we put our trust in Jesus Christ, but there are battles of contentment to fight all throughout the Christian life. We don't just become content because we come to Christ. We have to learn contentment. And that's encouraging, really. So if you're struggling with contentment, well, that's incredibly encouraging. But here is what I want us to see, maybe more than anything else, it's the third encouragement. And that is you are more apt to seek and find real gospel contentment when you sense your lack of it than you are to seek and find real gospel contentment when your circumstances are providing you a greater measure of contentment. Do you hear that? You're more likely to find gospel contentment when you realize your lack of real contentment, then if you are in a circumstance in life where your situation provides you with such comforts that you're really not thinking about the real thing. That's why Jesus said, it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, why is that? Well, it's not because money is inherently bad. Rather, it's because the rich man can mistake circumstantial contentment for gospel contentment. He can mistake a superficial, temporary contentment with a deep, permanent, and eternal contentment. And it's more difficult for him to, real, to seek real contentment because, well, he doesn't sense his lack of the real thing. His circumstances are making him content. So if you're out there today and you're listening to this sermon, you're saying, yes, pastor, I am deeply discontent well, I have good news for you. Because you are more likely to seek real contentment and find it than someone who is content in his or her circumstances. And dear friends, that is why what the health and wealth preachers are saying around you is so deadly. They're saying, look, God wants you to be affluent. God wants you to have stuff. And the deadly thing about that is, it is precisely the stuff and the affluence that so easily blinds us to the real thing. Therefore, God, in His kindness, often takes away the stuff and He puts us in hard life circumstances and situations so that we can realize, you know, Lord, I really don't have gospel contentment, but boy, do I want it. And although it doesn't feel like it at the time, it is so kind and gracious of God to do that to us to pull the chair out from under us, to take our legs out from under us, so that for the first time in our lives we realize that we don't have the real thing. And by the grace and help of Holy Spirit, we, we want that. And eventually we will accept no substitute for gospel contentment. You know, people today are very lonely, even in their primary relationships. Maybe a wife has a husband who's not particularly aware of her emotional needs. He's pretty closed off. All he wants to talk about is logistics, you know, where we're going to eat dinner tonight, what we're going to have, where we're going to go, what we're going to do next. Or he's fixated on his career. And the wife, she just wants a friend. And, and she gets up the courage one day and she says, you know, if I could just have one good friend who loved me and cared about me, 
Now, honey, don't get me wrong. I know you love me, but I need a friend. I need someone I can talk to, someone who understands me, someone who will share life with me and encourage me. I'm so alone. Or husbands, have you ever looked across the breakfast table at your wife and said, Honey, I hate what I'm doing in my life. It pays the bills, puts clothes on our backs, puts food in our mouths, gives us a place to live. I make good money, but I hate it. I hate getting up in the morning. I can't wait for it's time until it's time for me to come home at night. I am miserable. I'm not content with where I am. And I don't know what to do because I can't provide for us like I'm providing now if I change, but I don't want to keep doing what I'm doing. Month after month, you just feel like you're slipping deeper and deeper into despair. And you're deeply dissatisfied and discontent with where you are. And in either situation, you look up to heaven and you say, Lord, this is not where I thought I would be. This is not what I thought I was buying into. This is not the dream of my heart as a child for my life. Dear friends, I want you to understand, if that's where you are today, then you are poised for a great discovery. And that is that your contentment doesn't come from those things. I know that's hard to hear. But your contentment cannot come from your circumstances. It cannot come from things. But the encouraging thing is, on the other hand, your circumstances cannot stop the contentment of God. Your contentment, and that's what we're going to learn next, your contentment is non-circumstantial. If you are after gospel contentment, if you are after real contentment, well, the first thing you learn is that true contentment is non-circumstantial. And you're more apt to seek real gospel contentment and find it if you're here this morning and you don't have it, then if you're here this morning and you're just basking in your circumstantial contentment of this world. That's really good news. Thirdly, then, the secret of contentment. So what's the secret? That might be what you've been waiting for. Uh, perhaps you were going to skip all the other points this morning, but that was one you were, you were not going to miss. Well, here it is. It's simple. He tells us in verses 11 through 13, really the second half of verse 11 down through... Verse 13, listen to what he says. For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. So what has he told us this far? He is telling us that his contentment does not come from his circumstances that circumstances do not contribute to or detract from the gospel contentment that he enjoys. Now, that's still not the secret to contentment, but it sets us up to hear the secret. He's telling us the kind of contentment I'm talking about is not from circumstances. Now, other rural religions will try to teach you about contentment. In fact, all forms of Buddhism are really concerned that you cultivate contentment. But interestingly, one significant brand of Buddhism says that the way you cultivate contentment is you lower your expectations. That, that's how you cultivate contentment. Now trust me, I'm not a Buddhist, never wanted to be. But that makes some sense from a human standpoint, doesn't it? I mean, it is harder for me to be disappointed if I have low expectations. And unknowingly, without embracing Buddhism at all, I've, I've kind of tended to think that way sometimes, thinking that the secret to contentment is just to lower my expectations. Now, there's a biblical paradigm that we need to embrace concerning our expectations because, well, we live in a fallen world. We are sinners, and, and we live in a world full of sinners. Jesus told us that we would suffer in this life, that we are not home yet, so we need to embrace that reality. But Paul is telling us at the outset Contentment does not come from your circumstances or from your lowered expectations of those circumstances. But gospel contentment, real contentment, comes from someplace else. And he tells us the secret of contentment in verse 13. He says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In other words, here it is. The secret of contentment is God's providence 
apprehended by your soul. Let me say that again. God's providence apprehended by your soul. It's not just the doctrine of God's providence, although I think we have to understand the doctrine before we can experience that contentment. But it's not just the doctrine of God's providence taught to you. It is the doctrine of God's providence embraced by your soul so that you believe it. Gospel contentment rests on a deep, personal, doctrinal, experiential embrace of God's providence. Now notice what Paul is not saying here in verse 13. He is not saying you can do anything. He's not saying you can be anything you want to be. We all have limitations. What he's saying is, anything that I ask you to do, and any place where I put you, you can be content and thrive because I am the one who strengthens you. Have you ever heard the saying, God will not call you to do something that you cannot do? Well, it needs to go like this. God will never call you to do something that you can do. He'll never call you to do something that you can do. He will only call you to do what you cannot do without Him. And Paul is saying, I have learned that I can do nothing in and of myself, but I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. There's the secret to contentment. Now, dear friends, it will take you years and years to work that truth deeply down into your bones so that it becomes your default setting. But that's part of our sanctification. And it's the secret of contentment. Of course, the battle is getting that truth into our heart so that it dominates all of our circumstances. So that it's like uh, that truth is like the Mount Everest in our lives. It's towering above the piddling little molehills of our circumstances. However big, however real, however heartbreaking, however disappointing they are, the secret of contentment is deep, personal, doctrinal, experiential embrace of God's providence. Fourthly then, the theme song of contentment. The one way to look at this is that contentment kind of has a song or a theme in your life. You know, some of, some of you no doubt have theme songs for, for certain things that have happened in your life. I mean, whether it was years ago, you, you'd broken up with a really bad boyfriend or girlfriend, you've got a theme song for that. Or you've been through a rough circumstance in your life and you have a theme song for that. Well, songwriters and musicians have made a good living writing songs and singing these kinds of songs because when you hear one that speaks to your circumstance, well, you can't get it out of your head. There are songs that when you hear them on the radio, or you start to sing them, all sorts of things start flooding back. And you remember what you went through. Well, contentment has a theme song also. And the lyrics are written down in verse 19. Here it is. My God will supply every need of yours according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. You remember years ago, there was a Christian song that came out. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, my grace is sufficient for me. Thy grace is sufficient for me. My God will supply all my needs according to His riches and glory. He gives His angels charge over me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me, for me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me. Well, friends, that is really the theme song of contentment. The song of contentment is, Lord, I believe that your supply of my needs is more real than the air that I am breathing right now. I believe that your supply of all my needs is more real than the food that I eat. I believe that your supply of my needs is more real than the fact that I am sitting here listening to this sermon this morning. I believe that your supply of my needs is more real, more lasting than any circumstance that I'm in right now or that I can ever face. That is my theme song. And until the truth of God's providence has worked its way down into our hearts so that it is really our reflex reaction, the minute that we're in any difficult circumstances in life, well, then we haven't yet apprehended the secret of contentment in the way that we need to. Fifthly, there's one last thing, the gratitude of contentment. Contentment is grateful. There's a gratefulness in contentment. And we see it in the doxology that Paul sings in verse 20, where he says, To our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. 
Contentment expresses itself in constant gratitude to God. God glorifying gratefulness flows from the heart of the one who is content. If you see a, pers a content person, you will also see in them a grateful person. Show me a, con a, a content person in gospel contentment, and I'll show you a person who is grateful to God. Put them in the worst circumstances of life, they will still praise God. Why? Because He has supplied all their needs, and they know it. And they would know that nobody else in the world can take away what He has supplied. The world can take everything else away, but they cannot take away what God has supplied. So they're grateful. Now let me make something clear. If you're a Christian who's listening to this sermon and you are discontent, well, in one sense, that's okay. But in another sense, that's not okay. It's not okay because God wants you to live in contentment. But it's also okay because God is so gracious to you that He's bringing you to the end of yourself. And you're at the starting block, really, for gospel contentment. If you're here today and you're, you're merely content in your circumstances, then you may not even be in the game yet. But if you're here and you're a Christian who is discontent, there's really good news that's waiting for you. Pick up your Bible and start working through it. And pray as you go through it. But you may be listening to the sermon today and you may be discontent and ungrateful. And the reason that you may be discontent and ungrateful is, well, maybe, maybe you've never put your trust in Jesus. Maybe you're not a Christian. Now, I want you to understand that what I've been telling the Christians here for the last 30 minutes will not help you at all unless and until you repent of your sins and you put your trust in Jesus Christ. Because apart from Him, there is no contentment worth having. But with Him, there is nothing in this world that can take contentment away from you. Father, we thank You today for Your Word. By the grace and help of Holy Spirit, will You help us taste, grasp, and experience true gospel contentment. And then by Your grace, will You never let us accept any substitute for that. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.